All right, special episode tonight. We got Mid American Co- Conference Coach of the Year, MAC team champions from last year. We have Scott Moore from Lock Haven University. Coach Moore, I know people think they might be seeing double because your brother Josh has been on the show. You guys are twins. Welcome to the show tonight. Love talking to Mid American Conference Coach of the Year, Scott Moore from Lock Haven. Coach, how you doing? Hey, we're doing great, man. It's a Wednesday night. Uh, on a zoom with Zeb. So it's wrestling season. We're ready to go. So everything wrestling related is on the topics for tonight. I love it. Also, this is the barbarian hour. And I know, you know, Josh Saspi, Josh comes out and does some stuff with you, right? At uh, uh, Matt town. Josh is uh, one of our sponsors for our fall classic tournament. He does a lot of team gear for us and supplies our guys with a lot of great hats. One that I got on right now and, and just a lot of good, good equipment. So, yeah, he's one of the best in the business. How good is that that you're rocking the brand and I'm having you on the Barbarian now? How, how, how good does that work out for us, huh? I, hey, man, I I, uh, I stand by. He does some really great work uh, with all his gear, but does a lot of good hats. Um, it's just one of those guys that's just easy to work with, um, drives all the way to from Cincinnati to Lock Haven to, um, to work our tournaments, to put his gear stand out, does a lot of team stores online. So, yeah, I'd swear by him. He's he's been a guy that we stuck with uh, one of Coach Carr's contacts when he was here. So, yeah, we love working with him. I text with him probably once a week and catch up with him and and try to come up with some new ideas. So he's he's one of the best in the game. So sometimes it doesn't work out like that for me when I'm talking to somebody who's so friendly to my sponsor. Obviously, you know, another <laughs> Ohio company is Rudis. So that's why I kind of had to start. I started another podcast called the Ohio Cast podcast. Um, And um, sometimes people don't actually want to come on the barbarian hour because that's not their guy. And I, and I, but listen, Hey, I get it. I understand that. And Josh gets that. So kind of had to branch out and, you know, with another new brand and, you know, it's my brand, the Ohio cast. And all we do is shift the camera 90 degrees. All this is the Ohio cast stuff right here (laughs) to my left. So make it, you know, this isn't rocket science coach Moore. I know you know that. Um, but uh, another brand, obviously, that I, you and I are both big into. I'm holding up a uh, packet of Defense Soap Wipes. And Guy Seiko, I know your brother, Josh. Guy was an NCAA qualifier for the Cleveland State Vikings. So, obviously, that's a huge brand for your brother. But you do some stuff with Guy Seiko as well, correct? Oh, yeah. We we uh, we use their product uh, religiously here at Lock Haven. And, um, and they're another – Great company that supports wrestling, gives back to the sport in, in many ways, but uh, helps small programs, obviously, uh, in a lot of functional ways uh, financially, but also in a way of uh, helping, you know, with the Defense Soap products. So, yeah, they're they're awesome. They uh, they sponsor our tournaments. They send Defense Soap travel packages to our champions. And, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to, to coach and recruit Gus out of high school. So, had a strong relationship with the family and, and didn't know that they were going to be famous one day, but it's uh, <laughs> great to have those partnerships and to work alongside. And uh, obviously the next big uh, recruit coming out of Ohio, Max Seiko, he'll be, he'll be coming up through the pipeline here in the next couple of years. Dude, he's really tough. And guy puts him in a lot of adverse situations this past weekend at the national middle school duels was one of them. Cause Max was really starting to win everything at his age group. And this week he was wrestling seventh graders. Max is like a third grader, <laughs> a fourth, a fourth grader. And um, he's 10 years old. And there's like obviously a huge difference when a 13, 14 year old is wrestling 10 year old Max Seiko. And, you know, he found out this week. And like you said, he is tougher. Max is really, really tough. And then obviously Gus had some injuries at UVA when you were coaching him at UVA and um, yeah, really good family. And it's easy to, uh, talk about their product and, and talk about barbarians easy to talk about defense. soap. I know those guys are friends as well and, and they work together, but those are, it feels good to me. I don't feel like uh, I'm selling snake oil when I have you know, <laughs> barbarian hour and I'm talking about defense soap. So I feel pretty good uh, talking about yeah. those two brands and, and you just, you and your brother just kind of are very in line with what, I, when I talk about those two things. So I like that. Guys are just good people. You know, it's, it's yeah. simple, you know, do good business, take care of your customers. And uh, so they're just good people that are enjoy to work with and they do a lot for our sport. So out of respect and out of respect to their products, you know, that's we're, we're grateful to have them um, on board with us here at Lock Haven, but also wrestling in general is grateful to have them in the game. 
So you were at the University of Virginia for a graduate year. Is that correct? I spent my last year, yeah, grad school uh, down there, my last year of eligibility. Okay. And then how many years did you coach at the University of Virginia? I was there for six years and um, two years with Coach Bernstein and then my last four with uh, the current coach, Coach Garland. Okay. And what were those years with, with Garland? And Bernstein was your actual coach, right? Correct. Correct. And then was Garland the assistant or was he at Cornell yet? Uh, he was at Cornell and uh, they brought him in from Cornell to be the head coach. And obviously a great opportunity to work with one of the best, best young coaches in the country and just his energy, enthusiasm and, and skill set, the things I learned from him and, you know, the things we were able to do at UVA and building the program uh, back up and just getting things rolling uh, was priceless. You know, I still talk to Steve quite a bit these days, but um, and they, they've had a ton of success within their program and they'll continue to have success. So I was a uh, young coach, just learning the ropes and, and uh, had some really good mentors, uh, but loved my time at UVA and uh, had a connection with a lot of obviously Gus Seiko and, and uh, Sean Harris, Nick Souls are some, some uh, St. Ed's guys, but uh, Jed Moore from Ohio. So recruited and coached a few guys from Ohio, but uh obviously folks a lot on recruiting for Pennsylvania and, um, you know, had some really good years down there and, and uh, loved my time. Were you there for the Heinrich match versus Borschel? I was there for that. Were I was not. The, the were you in the corner? You weren't in the corner. No, that was coach Clemson. He, he uh, Oh man. Yeah. That was, that was a, that was a heck of a match. And, you know, obviously, uh, you know, Chris was up big and, and uh, lights turned on and things got hot and, you know, between the ref hitting them for stalling and, and, and sweating and falling apart a little bit, end up losing the match. And, you know, I think that set uh, Coach Clemson back about five years. I think Coach Clemson probably struggled with that, that one a lot. But look at the coaching tree that Garling has had underneath him at UVA. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so Gavin was there at one point. Um, and then obviously you had um, – uh, so you, Garland – Clemson, and then I'm missing one more head coach. One more head well, coach. Manny Manny Rivera was there for a while, and so was Manny Jordan was Lee. there. I'm missing one more. Yeah, Jordan Lean. Jordan Lean. Uh, coach yeah. Lean's at Brown now. He was at Pitt. But were you with all those guys that we just mentioned? Coach Coach Manny Rivera, Lean, Gavin, Clemson. Did you did you overlap with all those guys at some point? So I was there. No, my first year we hired Pat to gain. And uh, he was with us. And then when he left, we had hired Clemson. And okay. um, so I was with him that last little bit of time. And then, you know, as those, as I left, I think there was, you know, every couple of years they replaced the coach and they, they'd always bring in some really good coaches and, um, you know, just, just the system that's in place down there that you're able to utilize a lot of different skill sets from recruiting and uh, learning the traits of financial aid. And, and um, so there's just a lot of value to working at a school like Virginia, I think all the coaches that came through there and with their mentorship with Coach Garland, I think they just learned a lot and, and really maxed out their potential and gave them an opportunity to excel and obviously lead their own programs. So it's like, it's wild to think about it. You know, UVA does a lot of, if you look at the competition, they're a public university and, and you know, year in and year out, it goes between like them and Michigan as the top public universities in the United States of America. If you look at Newsweek or whatever publication you're looking at, they go kind of back and forth. Um, obviously that's a great place in Charlottesville, um, founded by Thomas Jefferson, Monticello is not too far away. Um, obviously everything's right there. And then you have the opportunity to leave Charlottesville and, and come back to Pennsylvania where you're from, but you're from Franklin, right? Yep. So Franklin is in between like Clarion and, uh, Edinburgh. Is that correct? Yeah, pretty much right off 79. So in between, Clarion, Edinburgh, and Pitt. Just... The Allegheny National Forest, Allegheny River, all that's right there, yeah? Yep. Okay, so because I take my family, we go to Allegheny National Forest every year. I really like that, like, Kinzu area, the Allegheny Reservoir and all that stuff. It's really cool for me. I just love – I love uh, northwest Pennsylvania. I think it's a kind of a gritty, rugged area. I like the mountains over there. It's a, it's a good time. But you and Josh came out of high school. You're twins. Who's older between you and Josh, by the way? Well, I'm ten minutes older. You're ten, so okay. Well, already, already the first competition started. You're ten <laughs> minutes older. <laughs> right. So, so 
you know, you get the opportunity to come back and be the head coach at Lock Haven. And what was the progression from the Bonomo brothers to Waller, then you? Was that the pro- did I just get that progression right over the like 20 years there? Yeah. So when I, w- I was leaving Virginia, um, you know, it was a special place. And actually, the season, my our last season there, all the coaches had had daughters. So Jimmy Stanick, Steve Garland, Jim Harsha, Alex Clemson, and myself all had daughters. So it was a really unique season. Uh, we had won the ACC for the first time in, um, in 30, 30 some years. Wow. Um, and it was just, you know, top 15 finish at nationals, but at the end of the day, um, family was important. And, you know, we just decided that between me and my wife, that we wanted to move back to Pennsylvania and kind of start over. And so it was, it was a tough decision, but ultimately it paid off. Uh, we came back and, you know, I was just, trying to figure out what the next step was going to be. I knew I wanted to be involved with wrestling and, and wasn't quite sure if, you know, where that was going to be, but living close to Penn state, living close to lock Haven um, at the time, coach Waller was, was doing a good job trying to build the culture back up at lock Haven. So I decided to go, um, go work at lock Haven as a, as basically a volunteer coach. And um, coach Lackey was actually there who we just hired as our head women's coach. So it's funny how the things turn over, over the years. Uh, but yeah, it's just, getting ingrained in that community um, with the culture that Lock Haven wrestling has had the supporters and just the, you know, central PA in general, it was great to, you know, good change of pace from being out at UVA. Uh, obviously Virginia was a great place and a great school, but Lock Haven was just blue collar and uh, really comfortable and just met a lot of really good people. And um, as things moved along and just had an opportunity to interview and, and uh, obviously accept that position as a head coach and um, has, you know, continue to build over the last 10 years. When you look at leaving UVA, obviously I'm a huge Steve Garland fan. I know I haven't seen him since uh, Madison Square Garden in the final <laughs> X when Ayala was in the finals of the, uh, the, the true third place match to, to make the U S national team. Um, Garland. I mean, there's not a better coach with more energy who holds himself more accountable. Um, you know, being at the NCAA tournament for me, the emotions, right? Like you guys and Ronnie pairing making the finals, in 2018 was super special, right? Like there's, there's moments where I have these memories about the NCAA tournament and, you know, coach Carr was running up and down the tunnel and Ronnie makes the finals. Who he knock off Sorensen? I want to say from Iowa. Is that, is that what was the big match, right? Uh, yeah. Then Kaladzic from Princeton in the semis. Yeah. So, you know, and it's just like feeding off coach Carr's energy. I, I see the highest highs there, right? I see the highest highs, in the NCAA tournament. I also see the lowest lows. And um, the lowest low that I saw in uh, Madison Square Garden was George DiCamillo was wrestling one of the Rouser twins. And he's up by three points with, I want to say, maybe 10 seconds left. Rouser hits him for four points as, like, time expires, a two and a two. And Steve Garland was like, I've never seen a coach more dejected and upset in my life. It was like, that guy was like, you can tell that that guy lives there. He lives with, he lives in, I mean, he rides the roller coaster with his guys. Um, but like that, the emotions of the NCAA for me, that's never anything like fans going to be able to see. Right. right. And that's what's like so awesome about when I'm at the NCAA tournament, I get to see these things. And obviously coach Garland, you know, he's not going to be super pumped uh, about that <laughs> moment, but that takes, that takes George to the NCAA finals the next year. You need, I think you need the lowest lows. Like you had a lot of disappointment at Lock Haven before you had to get Ronnie into the NCAA finals, right? Before you guys punched through and got your first All-American under you. Like, there's a lot of low lows, right? And that low low for me, man, like he was walking around just dejected and he was like so upset. Is there a better guy to learn under than Steve Garland? Well, I mean, history proves itself. And obviously with the coaching tree, he's had uh, almost, um, I think, as many as any other coach. I know Coach Cool at Cornell has had a lot of uh, guys leave his program to become head coaches. But, yeah, Garland's awesome. You know, I think uh, his his skill set um, to teach, to motivate, and just his energy within the program. You know, we spent a lot of time together on the road um, recruiting. I mean, every single weekend, you know, every single weekend. You know, I look back and we put a ton of our time and energy and effort into building the program and, you know, impresses me that he still does that today, you know, after all these years, you know, 10 years later. Um, so he's probably in year 15 down there. He still seems to have the same passion and energy for the program and just uh, building the culture, the character of his athletes, 
and just the things that are important to him. Um, it's different in that program. So, you know, obviously graduating from Virginia and, and coaching there always have a, a special place there for me. And, um, you know, I love to follow their team. I love to just connect with Coach Garland and his staff. And um, But, yeah, it's it's a great place to learn, a great place to sort of get your feet wet and then jump in and, and have that skill set that you can to run your own program. So you have – what's your undergraduate from Penn State in? Uh, uh, crime law and justice. What is your grad degree from UVA? Virginia was uh, a school of education, leadership, foundational leadership. The Moors are smart dudes. <laughs> do you have one from uh, – do you have any degrees from Lock Haven? No, I never started any degrees there. I I, I moved back, and uh, when I first started coaching, I started a landscaping company and just, uh, you know, tried to make ends meet and just staying busy and being active. And um, it really helped connect in the community and just kind of get to know a lot of people, but never got back into the academic side of things. And, you know, now with coaching full-time and working on some different uh, fundraising campaigns and, you know, things that, that we need to continue to build our program, it takes up a lot of time. And, obviously raising a family, you know, being part of their, their lives as well. So I think that's important for us to have balance. Uh, wrestling is a big part of our life, but you also got to have balance in everything else you do. And especially at a small school, there's, uh, there's some extra steps that you have to take to, to do the things that you want to do to be successful, to build the culture, you know, to raise the funds and to create that type of excitement around your program. It takes just a little bit extra time. Typical maniac. I'm going to work 80 hours a week as a wrestling coach and be run a uh, landscaping service. That's that. Let's just put another 40 hour job. There's only 168 hours in a week. You know that you're yeah. probably putting about 120 of them into some type of work or another. Sounds about par for the course though. Huh? Coach Moore. Yeah. You see that a lot with it, with the small coaches. I know coach Hill at Edinburgh was, was doing his share of uh, yard work too when he was at Kent state. So I uh, have a lot of good conversations with him, but I mean, just, just being motivated to get up every day and to do more and to make a difference. Um, and then you have, you know, the, the push you got, you got to pay the bills. And, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to come back to uh, Pennsylvania and build a, build a house on the farm and, and uh, you know, invest some of the money that I'd worked for and saved into a, a nice place for the family. So, um, but with hard work, you know, become, comes reward and, um, you got to be able to visualize and 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 see what your future holds, and then just work, work towards it. And you know, it's the same message you send to your student athletes. It's the same same thing that you live by every single day. Obviously, the challenges for you guys at uh, Lock Haven being you, you and I believe women's field hockey are the only Division One sports at the university. Is that correct? Yep. So that model is kind of echoed across the state schools, the PSAC schools. Um. In the state of Pennsylvania, there's four of you that are currently in a Mid-American Conference with uh, Bloomsburg, Lock Haven, Edinburgh, and Clarion. And you were all former members of the Eastern Wrestling League, the EWL, which went under four years ago or five years ago. I, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, 2019 was the last year. Yeah, I covered the last one. So, um, yeah, 19. So, 2019, last EWL tournament. So, that'll be four years ago. Oh, wow, geez, 20, 21, 22, 23. There'll be four years ago this year. So that you guys were able to jump into the Mid-American Conference's affiliates. Um, how quickly did you have your – I know Josh and Cleveland State, your twin brother Josh, Cleveland State had their first MAC champ last year and Ben Smith at 197. Who was your first MAC champ for Lock Haven in the Mid-American Conference? So we had um, – I think it was – First year we were in the MAC, 2020. Um, Jared Seacrest was able to to win the 174 pound weight class. We had some, um, you know, some guys that were very competitive that year. We had Kyle Shoup, who became an All American. Um, we had Luke Warner, who was, you know, one of the top two seeds. But uh, Corey Hazel was in there. We we had a really good run. That was. Um, it was a senior class that we had that just came off two conference championships in the EWL. Uh, but Jared Seekers, who was probably uh, one of the guys that didn't have as much success over the years had never qualified for nationals came through and had some really good wins, uh, ended up beating McNally from Kent state in the finals. Um, and then the semifinals beat the, you know, that's when Missouri was in the conference. So we had a big upset in the semifinals. So we had, 
Jared Seacrest our first year. And then um, this year we had Benny Barton and Anthony Noto. So we've, you know, three champs um, at this time. And the first major award you got as far as either OW or freshman of the year was Anthony Noto at 125 pounds. He was the freshman of the year uh, in, in Ohio at, uh, in Athens at Ohio university in 2022, correct? Yep. Yep. He was, um, freshman of the year, uh, had gone in, I think he was 30, uh, 31 and one going into the conference and had won all his matches. So tremendous season for him and a lot of expectations, obviously after that year. And, um, this summer he was a university, uh, U 23 national champion and, uh, and freestyle. So, uh, just a guy that um, very explosive, just a uh, great all around wrestler, and you know, somebody that we can picture to be an All American this year for Lock Haven. And then he had a, a big upset at the NCAA tournament. Uh, who did he knock off? Was it Penn State? Yeah, he had drilled uh, Hildebrand. Hildebrand for Penn State. Yeah, he was a returning All American, you know, during the COVID year, but, you know, was ranked a little bit ahead of him. Uh, so not a huge upset, but obviously beating. Uh, beating a Penn state guy at the national tournament and just getting a win and, and getting, uh, building the confidence that the NCAA is big. So, you know, he came into the tournament, you guys come into the tournament, it's the toughest NCAA tournament, you know, to date in a lot of people's eyes. If you look at, you know, he had, you had Stevan Michich, who was an eighth year senior, a bunch <laughs> of five time NCAA qualifiers and five time all Americans. It's just incredible to think about it. You know, I was talking to Mickey Phillippe the other day, he's in the seventh year. It's just amazing what this COVID did to everything. Well, let's just talk about the challenges it really presented for you guys. You guys have a women's program at Lock Haven. I don't think a lot of people know about that. Let's talk about your women's program. Then I want to talk about some of the challenges that you guys have had through COVID and being a smaller school and transitioning in the Mid-American Conference and what you're doing. But you have a women's program. What is the roster of your women's program? And what's the current state of women's wrestling at Lock Haven University in, in central Pennsylvania? Yeah, so we first established a women's program uh, basically during COVID year. So after the national tournament uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, we came back and our president was at the, uh, the national tournament and uh, had met with Mike Moyer and they were doing, um, you know, just some some sessions on adding women's wrestling and the growth of the sport. And so we had um, we had obviously been pushing to get another full time assistant coach and adding Coach Perry to staff. Um, after he had become a national finalist in 2018. So within that conversation, I kind of joke around, we were at our social and we had, I think o o over 400 fans and alumni and supporters at the social. And I was sort of giving a speech and in front of our provost and president AD. And I, and I mentioned, Hey, it's great that I hear we're going to be adding an assistant coach to our program. And it kind of caught him off guard, but, you know, I think it got him thinking and basically the decision where we're going to add women's wrestling and um, you know, we're going to, add an assistant men's coach they would kind of be a dual position and uh with coach perry being around being a perfect uh candidate for that position uh we were able to move him right into that role so technically the covid year is our first year but um there was no recruiting involved so we just you know we had one wrestler on the team that year um and then the next year um you know covid hit so it took us uh took us a few years to get it going but this past year was our first really competitive year uh, we had five NCAA qualifiers. Uh, we had about eight girls on the roster. And um, then we had a good recruiting there this year. So we have about 15 girls on the roster now and just had a really big win against East Stroudsburg last week. And uh, exciting dual meet. We had, we had some great wins, individual wins. Uh, one of our girls, uh, Lily Shear, had a big win over the number three ranked wrestler in the country. Uh, so things are really starting to come together. Uh, after Nate Carr left, we had moved uh, Ronnie Perry over to the men's side, and then we hired a former national champion, Matt Lackey, to, to lead the women's program. So a lot of progression, uh, just some little steps. Obviously, everybody was um, set back by COVID, but uh, recruiting's on point now. We're, we're looking to get to about 22 or 23 women on the roster, and I really think that we have uh, a team that will be you know, in the top 10 of the NCAA, not technically NCAA tournament, the women's national tournament. Um, so we have – uh, three nationally ranked recruits coming in this year that have already uh, had some success and uh, coach Lackey's doing a great job. So it's, it's a cool addition to our program. You know, we work uh, alongside the women's program and uh, it's a unique blend that most schools don't have. So we're, we're fortunate to have it. And uh, I think it's going to benefit bro both programs uh, down the road. 
Coach Lackey was a co- an assistant coach under Coach Robbie Wall- uh, Waller, who you actually replaced as head coach. You you were the next head coach from Coach Waller. He was his assistant. Did he ever leave Lock Haven, Pennsylvania? Did he go back to Illinois? What did he do in the, the in-between time between the assistant to Waller to now being your head women's coach? Yeah, he was all over the place. I mean, he went to Buffalo to coach for a few years for Jimmy Beekner. Uh, when he was at Buffalo, he got his MBA. And then from there, they moved to Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, he was working for Stryker Pharmaceutical there for a while. Um, and then left there, was working for a, a vet company. And um, and then they had moved to Little Rock, Arkansas. And he was working for an educational uh, software sales company down in Little Rock. So he had jumped around quite a bit. He had got back in wrestling. Uh has some daughters that, that wrestle and he had been part of Pat Smith's club out in Little Rock, Arkansas. And so he had kind of been dabbling in wrestling. And then, you know, I think his family just decided it was time. Um, obviously being from state college, uh, Elisa Galloway, who, uh, uh, her brother, Nate Galloway wrestled with us at Penn state, me and my brother. So we, we had some mutual connections, obviously working with them, but when they moved back to, uh, to state college, um, you know, he had reached out and, um, you know, through the interview process and, um, you know, through some, some deep conversations, um, he decided to, to get back into wrestling. He also had started a, uh, Gallico home services, which is a, essentially like a home service company. So he was, he was dabbling in some other things and, and, um, but then, you know, wrestling, like it always does, it pulls you back in. So we've had him with us for about a month now, and, um, it's great to have him back on staff and, I think it's going to be uh, very beneficial for both programs and just just his energy, his passion, his connection to the sport and his success, I think, uh, bodes well for the future of, of both of our programs. Well, Lackey's a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's not at all, man. Like you're saying, I remember, yeah. you know, he, he went to Buffalo and was under Beekner. And then um, they actually had some they had really talented guys. And then who ended up transferring just a couple guys, one D2. And then, you know, he, after that, I kind of lost track of him after he left Buffalo, but I knew he had daughters. He had a bunch of daughters. We had three, four daughters. Yeah. He has four daughters now. Four daughters. Yeah. And I remember like one of his daughters was a baby when I was there doing the stuff where, because of the partnership between the EWL and flow wrestling, I was doing that, um, that, that media partnership. I was the one that was the content guy for all of it. And he was always super cool to me. And I remember his wife and yeah, he was always just like, Really good to me, an awesome guy to talk to. I like Coach Lackey. He's a good guy. I'm glad to hear that he came back uh, around to us. I didn't even know he was in Little Rock. That kind of blows my mind, that part. That's awesome, though. I love hearing it, and, that, you know, he kept his kids involved in it, and he stayed involved. And, yeah, I bet he's going to be foot sweeping people. Yeah, he's – he's uh, it's fun to have him back. You know, he's been out of the wrestling as far as, like, the college level for a while, but – um, so it's, it's taken him a couple of weeks to just kind of get back in a swing of things, but just having him around his personality, you know, his humor, and then also his intelligence, uh, and then his, his contacts, you know, he's very re- well respected in the wrestling community. Um, and he's a, a visionary, he's a, he's a deep thinker. So it's just adds that depth to, uh, myself, coach Perry, coach Weichel, and, um, you know, our, the rest of the staff that we have at, at Lock Haven. So we're, you know, like everybody else, just trying to put good people around our athletes and, and coaches that motivate and build character and instill the right, you know, character that and qualities that we need to continue to bring our program, um, bring our program forward, you know, in this tough environment that, we, that we're working in now. So I got to actually see some of your girls wrestle and call some of their matches at the PWC, the Pittsburgh Wrestling Club. It was at like uh... – MMA uh, gym in Pittsburgh on the South side. Uh, That was cool. But the big thing that for me to talk about when I talk about women's wrestling and and D one NAI schools, it's like this mixed, like you said, it's not an NCAA tournament. It's a women's wrestling tournament. They wrestle freestyle. And I don't know if a lot of people realize that our women at the collegiate wrestle level, wrestle freestyle. Talk about that. And that change for you as far as running two programs and being the head of both of them. Ultimately, it all comes down to you. Like you are responsible for hiring and developing and helping with their recruiting and making sure they're out, they're uh, head stays above water. But it's it's freestyle, right? Women's wrestling in college is freestyle. Yeah, it is. So it is different, and uh, but I think it's good. You know, it keeps the coaching staff sharp. Um, 
and we we as men wrestle freestyle. Obviously, once the season's over, we hit the U twenty, U twenty threes, universities. Uh, we usually do some different dual tournaments. So yeah, it gets we're able to go a little bit more together. But uh, the women, you know, they come to our practices. Uh, you know, they they have their own practices, but they also come in and they're around our guys quite a bit. Um, so it's it's just sort of a uniform operation. You know, the intensity, the culture of the room, and just you know the expectation that they see that our men uphold and um you know i think it's going to help build our program and it's a unique resource there's not many programs in the country that have an operating division one men's program training alongside them um, so our coaching staff is very deep we, we're able to uh, maximize our potential by having you know different volunteer coaches on the women's side that can also you know be in the room for the men and um, so we're just trying to build something special that uh, is unique and you see a lot of uh with women's wrestling growing i think they just added the seventh 75th school in pennsylvania uh at the high school level so you see a lot of brother sister combinations uh we have next year coming in we have a recruit that uh you know brother sister state champions from west virginia uh just yesterday we had a uh, two big recruits in and their sister wrestles you know so you start seeing that combination so i think if we can connect the two together and you know, if you have two brothers that wrestle, that you're going to be pretty tough. So uh, we're, we're able to combine, you know, that that recruiting effort and bring in the best of the best on both sides. And I think when our men see how competitive the women are, and um, you know, the work that they're putting in, they're just as dedicated, disciplined in wrestling. And uh, so it just drives that that message home that you know we're a team, we got to work together. And um, and it's also a fan base. You know, you build a fan base for one, then you can. Uh, expected that crowd's going to show up for, for both matches. And uh, we saw that against East Stroudsburg last week. We had, uh, you know, probably close to 500 fans for our first women's duel. You just don't see that, you know, like you don't see that at many schools. And then um, our first home duel, we have a women's match uh, right before our match, our first uh, big match of the year uh, in which Coach Carr Davidson, they're coming into the field house. So it's a whiteout match, which is, typically our biggest crowd uh, we're planning on over 2000 fans and trying to expose the women to that same crowd. And they're going to be wrestling right before us. Uh, so it's just unique. Yeah. It adds work. It adds uh, just a lot of conversations and just planning with, with practice room and, and resources and things. But uh, ultimately, you know, you're, you're stronger to, to have that type of uh, relationship with the women's program. And um, it's very beneficial for the university as well. Obviously, your expectations are for them to win the collegiate title. You want them to win that tournament at the end of the year. There's and, and I think you can do it really quickly at a place like Lock Haven, especially, like you said, lending the men's intensity to the women's program and working side by side and seeing those high expectations. I know that the Hawkeyes are in, uh, in the process right now of, of recruiting more. That was huge, though, when the Iowa Hawkeyes announced they were going to have it. Obviously, you're going to get a bunch more power fives that are probably going to follow. We can speculate that, I think. But I, it's it's huge for you guys to be on the front end of it, even if, even ahead of the Hawkeyes, right? Yeah, it's it's a small school thing right now. I mean, it's a you know it's an advantage for enrollment driven schools. It's an advantage for smaller schools. Um, but the goal is you see a lot of the even bigger programs like Princeton and, and North Carolina. Even Ryder has a women's wrestling club, so. Uh, they're going to find a way to to integrate uh, those clubs into you know some of these national events, uh, but yeah, it's um, it's it's starting to grow. Um, it has not been sanctioned in PA yet, but I would assume by the end of the year it'll be sanctioned in PA, and uh, from there, you know, different scholars, different schools as far as D two, D three, and AIA, and then hopefully some Power Five schools will continue to add it. Uh, but yeah, we're we're ahead of the curve. We have some really good uh, athletes in our program. Uh, multiple nationally ranked women. Um, and, you know, I think come March, we'll have um, my, my thoughts of probably three or four NCAA All-Americans uh, on the women's side and hopefully a couple on the men's side too. I know that I talked to John Carroll. They're a Division three school here in Ohio. They just started it. And then, you know, Tiffin has it. And I know, like you just said, it's enrollment driven. It's, it's the smaller school thing. It's their advantage. You draw more. Um, you know, when it, when it's enrollment driven, that means you want more people on the team. You want more student athletes that are there, maybe not necessarily on scholarship, but they're there and they're being drawn to the school to do, uh, you know, an extracurricular and obviously go to school. Cause that's what the, all this is about. But um, 
you guys are fighting some crazy uphill battles in the Mid American Conference uh, as far as the men's go. Um, the name, image, likeness. Um, not a lot of the Mac schools are going to be paying guys. They're not going to be getting from local businesses or international businesses. They're not going to be getting name, image, likeness deals. And you're going to lose some recruits to that. How do you guys combat what has become uh, of the NCAA student athlete and the name, image, likeness? And what do you say to a kid who's like, well, they're going to give me $10,000 to post on social media once a month from this car dealership. How do you guys combat what that's become and, and, and keep bringing in guys and girls uh, onto your teams at Lock Haven? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an opportunity. You know, I mean, obviously it's, it's a little bit easier for bigger schools. Um, you know, just, just got an email today from Penn State basically promoting that uh, success with honor, which is essentially their um, their identity as, as NIL to, to be able to grow the, the, the fund for student athletes and employment for student athletes. And, you know, so trying to trying to take their verbiage and take the things that they're doing and initiate a plan here at Lock Haven. And I think every every school is trying to do it. It's just a matter of how quickly and how efficient they can be. Um, so we, you know, we're going to, we're going to come up with our version of that. Uh, but we're just going to continue to stick with what we're good at, which is, you know, training, developing, developing student athletes, um, and just getting the most out of our guys, a blue collar mentality, show up, have a vision, work hard and, um, you know, trying to get the best kids that we can get. Uh, but yeah, I think that's going to, it's going to create some challenges uh, across the field, but you know, my mindset is we got to just compete with the schools in the Mac and uh, figure out a way to get the best recruits we can get. And uh, we, you know, we've got some great recruits. we got some good guys on the team. we got guys that are currently have some small NIL deals right now with, with apparel companies, but that'll grow, you know, it grows with success. It grows with exposure. Um, and that's why we are wrestling better teams this year. Um, you know, we're trying to put ourselves up against some of the best teams so we can, you know, the, the companies and, you know, our alumni or, or, our um, the people that support our program, our corporate sponsors, or even, you know, somebody from right up the road that, you know, that, that has the potential to help us out sees that we're trying to compete against the big schools. That's why we're going to the national duels and wrestling teams like Penn state and NC state and, and hitting some of these bigger competitions up because our, our athletes are just as deserving. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's about uh, how successful you are and uh, what kind of foot traffic you bring in, you know, on the social media scene. So, you know, those are things the athletes got to do on their own too. They got to build the following and they got to build, you know, that, that as well. And that, that can't come from the coaching staff um, that has to, you know, we can, we can control the things within our program, um, you know, which is, which is what we do, but the athletes have to, to stand out and they gotta, they gotta be able to promote themselves and um, be someone that they, that these companies and these businesses that are, they want to put their name on. And, you know, I think, all athletes have that opportunity. So that's, what's key. It's not just big schools that have that opportunity, but um, you know, they kind of start ahead of the curve with, with their connections and their partnerships that they already have in place. And, you know, their universities are already creating opportunities. So, you know, we're going to follow suit and do the best we can do. Um, and I think we're, we're going to come up with some good ideas, being creative and, you know, having a staff that thinks outside the box is key and, and having a staff that's well-connected in uh, the community and has good partnerships, you know, we're going to find ways to continue to get the best guys for our program that want to be at Lock Haven. Uh, there's a ton of advantages to being in a small school, to being in a big wrestling community. And I think we, we create just as much excitement and um, just as much of a fan base as a lot of the schools, a lot of the big 10 schools, a lot of, um, a lot of the top 25 programs. I think we just, we have just as much to sell and there's just, just as much excitement around our program and, you know, that can be seen from our home, home dual meets from, you know, our socials at the NCAA tournament. Um, you know, we've had years at the national tournament, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, where we had over, over 400 tickets uh, through Lock Haven. So we're, we're on that same scope. We just got to find a way to utilize our skills and maximize the, the relationships that we currently have and find ways to be just as creative as these big schools to, to be able to take care of the athletes for the work that they're doing. So I just like uh, today I saw a couple commercials for Ohio State's quarterback and one of their wide receivers, uh, Stroud, and they had some guy. It's like they were doing like a, almost like a uh, they were wearing suits, and the guy was a, a fashion designer, and they're in the horseshoe, you know, they're in this massive stadium, 
you know, how do you compete with that? Right. Like how do you compete with Roman Bragovo young being able to be on barstool sports, you know, like how do you compete with a lot? What a lot of these, you know, Gable Stevenson, what he was able to do last year. It's really hard to compete with those guys. Like you said, cause they've got these massive flagship brands, right? Like Penn state's a massive flagship brand. Ohio state's a massive flagship brand, Minnesota. They are, you know, they are the U up there. Uh, obviously Michigan, Michigan state, that state split, but like, we know that Penn State is Pennsylvania, right? Everybody knows that. We all get that. I mean, I can see over your shoulder. I'm looking at this Penn State singlet, right? You know, you're an All-American there. It, it's just the, they have these massive flagship brands, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, right? We just keep saying these, you know, Oak, Alabama, right? Uh, Jackson State, they're starting to pay. They got, they're paying somebody some inordinate amount of money. So it's <laughs> like it, it's crazy to see what it's become and, I just the, – the field is just so not level. I mean, it's just – it's wild to me to see you guys do what you're able to do year in and year out at the NCAA tournament. Like, once again, I get, like, this crazy bird's eye view from the tunnels and seeing everybody warming up, and I get to see all these crazy emotional moments. But for you guys to be able to compete at that level, it's, it's just, like – it's amazing to me. It's amazing because what you're up against compared to what you have, I, I, I love it. I Because I'm – you know, I went to Kent State, and I'm a – small school guy. And I just, I, I'm into that. I like that. And that's just kind of my jam. You know, I like that. And I like to see what you guys are able to do with it and how you're competitive. Talk about Matt town, explain to people what Matt town is in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. Yeah. I mean, Matt, Matt town USA is a nickname that we, you know, that we were sort of given back in, um, back in the seventies. And, um, you know, we had a lot of success at the high school level. We had a lot of success at the college level. Uh, our teams were winning in the late sixties. We're winning in AIA national team titles. Uh, guys like Gray Simons, Freddie Powell, Kenny Melchior. Um, you know, it's just some standout wrestling that was uh, the blacksmiths. I mean, there's just so much, so much uh, history at Lock Haven. But at the same time, the local high schools were winning state titles, and um, and people were flying in the Piper Museum, uh, the Piper Airport to uh, to see matches. So. A lot of money, a lot of success. You know, Lock Haven was hosting uh, some of the um, the trials and some of the uh, the senior level events. Um, you know, so that was that was the terminology they came Matt Town USA, and eventually in the '90s they started the Matt Town Wrestling Club, and uh, it's a nonprofit wrestling club that's still here today. You know, and uh, has been passed on from generation to generation, and uh, the Turner family, Neil Turner, all the way through Carl Poff, and and then. And obviously now and, and um, under our leadership and our guidance within our staff. But, yeah, it's just um, it's just more of a mentality. Also, it's you know, we, we all have wrestling clubs. We all have nonprofits that we're able to help uh, pay for um, additional resources, additional coaches, additional travel, different things that you do in the summer through freestyle. But, you know, Matt Town USA, it's more of a mentality and a mindset too. just just knowing that hey, this is a, a lot of great wrestlers came out of this. Uh, the school and the area. Um, so we, you know, we have hats, you know, we have obviously uh, a lot of uh, product at Matt town USA. It's, it's where great wrestlers are developed. Um, it's where great wrestling coaches are developed. We have um, quite a few college coaches that came through our program and um, you know, a kind of a big coaching tree that came out of our program over the last uh, 20 years. So some of the best high school coaches, um, Lock Haven was a teacher's college for a long time. So we've, uh, some of the best coaches, uh, to this day, you know, even, even in their sixties, um, all the way down to some of the, the recent grads. So we just have a, a huge, huge, huge following of wrestling and guys that have been through here that are coaching that have had success and just a, a great connection. And our, our, you know, sports special that we can have such a small school that has national relevance that people know of Matt town of Lock Haven all the way across the country. And, you know, probably in different parts of the world. So uh, we just got to continue that, that, that mentality of it's Matt town USA. You come here to wrestle, you come here to get better, you know, and you develop as a coach and uh, we're continuing to, to keep that mindset and, um, you know, obviously give back to the sport, but maintain that, that identity that you could be good at a small school. You can be an all American and you can obviously create a lot of great memories at, at Lock Haven. So Coach Colat, Kerry Colat was a national champ for you guys. Uh, coach Rogers, Franklin and Marshall was the head coach in Franklin and Marshall. Coach Sahara, uh was the head coach at Cleveland State before your brother. He's a uh, 
Lock Haven guy. Good Ale, Coach Good Ale, Rutgers. He's a Lock Haven guy. So just like off the top of my head, those are the guys I can just rattle off. Mm-hmm. It, it, just right now, thinking about it, like obviously you got another head coach who left there. Um, you know, David's coming in, like you said, right? Coach Carr. I mean, it's just awesome to see, you know, who's made stops or been there, wrestled there, been a coach there. And then now, like you said, you got a pretty good coaching tree from Lock Haven. And, you know, I mean, it's a special place, right? And, and uh, I think we had at Kent State, we had Tyler Buckwalter. He was a Central Mountain guy, I want to say. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Tyler was at uh, Central Mountain grad and his dad, Duck Buck. Buckwater wrestled at Lock Haven and um, coached at Central Mountain for a long time and actually coached at Lock Haven in the late 90s. Um, so just a great family, good wrestling family. Yeah, I love those people, really good people. Uh, you know, you guys do just a great job. Um, you had a lot of challenges, and we talked about the challenges that you guys had. And, and my thing was I saw you guys uh, with your challenges with the COVID year. Um, Werner came to – Luke Werner came, and I don't know what girls came. I forget which girls came to the Pittsburgh wrestling uh, club, the the MMA gym where we had the the match. But to look at that, that was the only wrestling that anybody from Lock Haven did. You guys had canceled your season essentially. And then something kind of came rabbit out of a hat. Um, at the tail end of COVID, the year it was um, the, the following year after it got canceled in Minnesota. So the 2021 NCAA tournament, Talk about what happened to you guys right before the MAC tournament and what led to what happened to you going into the MAC tournament. Your whole season got canceled, and then what happened for you guys to be able to wrestle the 2021 MAC tournament at Ryder? Yeah, it was obviously a crazy year for everybody, but um, yeah, on our, our, under our leadership, which has changed, but at the time, they just decided that um, based on some restrictions and resources that we weren't going to be able to um compete that season and um you know i think this season started off slow for everybody you know so that was normal protocol but as we got into december and january a lot of other teams started to compete um including some other all the other schools within the conference so it was just a weird time you know there's a lot of a lot of conversations of trying to figure out how we could do it um there was a change uh, and, and leadership about two weeks before the conference tournament. So our leadership was now the president of, um, of Bloomsburg and Lock Haven. So um, at that point in time, Bloomsburg had been wrestling for about a month. So um, we had kind of pushed to just to give our guys an opportunity to compete. And um, so we had, you know, less than two weeks um, to get prepared for the MAC tournament and, you know, all the restrictions of, you know, one partner wrestling a mask and all those things that, that I think everybody was dealing with. But, um, yeah, so, you know, being wrestlers, being competitive, and uh, we believe that, hey, we can, you know, within 10 days we can get ready to compete, which uh, obviously proved to be a bigger challenge than we had anticipated. And um, it just proved a lot about what it takes to be successful, the process, um, and just the growing pains of the season that gets you to your, that end game and gets you to that point of peaking at the right time. So, yeah, it was it was um it was a weird moment, you know, going to the MAC tournament. Um, you know, expectations were, hey, we're here to wrestle. We'll see what happens. And uh, having one wrestler place was just uh, kind of a low point for us. I mean, having uh, you know been to the MAC only the second year, we knew it was a tougher conference. But the year before, we had you know six national qualifiers. So you know, you're always going to go in with a little chip on your shoulder, thinking that hey, we can compete but it, it didn't happen, you know, and it was painful. So we just took that with us and um, we took sort of that mindset of, Hey, we're, you know, we were kind of robbed this year, but what can we do now moving forward? Let's not look behind us anymore. And uh, we had a good summer of training. Uh, we just continue to work and just continue to show up. And I think that's the message always is no matter what the circumstance continue to show up and, you know, um, good things happen, you know, good things happen to us. And we were able to bring in some, um, some guys in the program. We were able to develop some guys. Uh, we had a really young group. We had a lot of new faces. So we essentially, um, you know, only had one returning guy in the lineup that year at the Mac tournament, but we were able to, you know, come out with nine place winners in our first ever Mac championships and something that's going to be special for forever. I think it was one of the biggest 
accomplishments as a coach to go from last to first and to uh, just to bring a young team along through the challenges to be able to come out on top and, um, you know, just the, the experience that our athletes and the coaches were able to, to go through that year was priceless. I look at that tournament and uh, obviously central Michigan is normally the team that everybody's like, you know, they're, they're the prohibited favors. Usually um, Mizzou, obviously the whole time they were in the conference, they won the conference every year. They changed the conference. They changed the dynamic of the conference. But before that central Michigan was the Missouri of the mid American conference. Coach uh, Borelli is obviously a veteran. What he's done in Mount Pleasant, Michigan has been amazing, right? I looked at your Mac rankings and they're like 12th, 11th or 12th, something crazy. And I'm like, I, I just don't think that's central Michigan. That guy's such a great coach. This guy's always got a game plan. They execute his game plan. If you don't want to execute his game plan, I don't know if you're going to be a Mount Pleasant very long. And I think that's a great thing about Tom Borelli and what he's done in Mount Pleasant. But I saw they were ranked near the bottom. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I think they were 12th or 11th. And I was like, yeah, that's not the Central Michigan. And then I think they were the favorite going in because they had Stencil. They had all these other guys, right? They had guys that were um, uh, Dresden Simon and they had lost. Uh, they lost a 25 pounder to Penn State who Noto beat. You know, I mean, and Hildebrandt. So it's like, you know, they got Love It. They got all these guys. They got guys. But you guys were able to go in there and, and, and Russell Lockhaven, Matt Town, Gritty, Tough wrestling in Athens, right? And Ohio University didn't have a great tournament. A lot of these teams kind of fell by the wayside while you guys just kept winning, kept winning, kept winning, put a, put some guys in the finals, got some champs, right? Did you have three champs? We had four finalists, two champs. Two champs. So four finalists, two champs, ultimately finalists, and then guys coming back and taking third. You know, people coming back, who you know, leaving points, leaving points out there is the worst thing you can do. And then coming through the backside, you need that. How did you do on the backside of the 2022 Mac? Our guys did, did awesome. You know, we had um, Gable Strickland was a true freshman. He took third. Um, and that was good for, you know, that was obviously a tough semifinal match really could have been in the finals, but yeah, everybody wrestled back. You know, we had one guy that didn't place, um, but yeah, everybody wrestled back and just, just we're winning matches. You know, we knew going into the last day that we had to win, we had to win matches. And, um, you know, I knew that the mentality was there. The guys were on point. You know, they were they were excited to compete. Uh, I remember watching the first, the one twenty five pounder from Central Mission pinned his kid in the first wrestle off, uh, the first wrestle back. So I was like, oh, there's two points plus advancement. So you know, you start looking at points, and then you're like, you know what? We just got to win the, We got to win our matches. Um, and our guys came through. You know, all the way. Um, you know, uh, Deshaun Farber wasn't seen. He came back and took fifth. Uh, had beat uh, beat some really good guys. Uh, had beat uh, more from Clarion. Had pinned them the number one of the top seeds, and then came back through and uh, ended up being a national qualifier. I don't even think he had a winning record, but he came back and took fifth. Um, you know, one one sixty five, one seventy four. These guys, Isler was in the finals. Uh, one seventy four, Stolzus, one eighty four. Fagley beat three guys at the at the MAC tournament that he lost to throughout the season. Um, and then at 197, our one of our only seniors, Parker McClellan, came back and and took seven. So things just fell in place. You know, guys won matches. It wasn't like they were beating guys they shouldn't beat, but just being consistent. You know, um, and and having fight, having intensity, and uh, it was a team effort. Um, you know, having nine place winners, having some bonus point victories, and then uh, when Anthony Noda won the the 125 final, and then I think the big one was when Ben Barton, uh, Benny beat um, Love It at 157. So that kind of took, that was a, a double win beating uh, central Michigan and that weight class. And love it was ranked, I think as, as high as 12th. And, uh, you know, it had just beaten a top 10 guy the week before against Michigan. So Ben, Ben just had a great uh, game strategy against him and, and uh, had won that match. So we just, just a real team effort. And, um, you know, you knew it was going to happen though. I think as, as the tournament went on, our guys continue to get better. And, um, you know, and there's some other teams that had a good tournament there, too. I think Buffalo had a really good tournament. Um, you know, Cleveland State wasn't – they were maybe fifth or sixth. So, they're um, – and the MAC is is a tough conference. Uh, we need to get more high-level guys. I guess guys compete in the national tournament. But 
as far as the top conference, it's pretty, there's a lot of parity. And I think you'll see the same thing this year. And as you mentioned, Central Michigan came in um, with the first team tournament rankings, like somewhere at 10th, 11th, which is obviously way too low. They're going to be, they're going to be competitive every year. Yeah. I mean, the guy is just, he's a master at it. And I've, and I've seen it year after year after year after year. He just, he goes and he gets these kind of like under the radar guys, coaches them up, has a game plan. Uh, one of the, the most prepared coaches in all of college wrestling in Tom Borelli. And, you know, I got a ton of respect for him. He does a great job, man. But, uh, you know, you look at it, do you, you got the target on your back now, right? Like it, pressure's off central Michigan pressure's on uh, lock Haven, right? The bald Eagles, they got to, they got to bring it this year, right? Like you, you guys, you know, you're the coach. You want to, you can feel the target. What do you got to do to repeat and, and, and kind of make this an annual thing and get the ball rolling so that's bald Eagles bringing the title back for the Mac to your guys' campus uh, year in and year out? Yeah, I mean, we return, um, I think, eight of our starters, seven seven guys that are will be competing. One was going to be redshirt this year. So, um, you know, we have a great opportunity to repeat as Mac champions, but it takes a lot of effort and just – and just luck, you know, keeping guys healthy, uh, keeping guys motivated, uh, keeping them humble. You know, after winning, you can see guys, just they take that with them a little bit too far. And uh, so, yeah, the goal is to challenge our guys competitively, wrestle tough competition, and then, again, peak at the end of the year when we hit those conference duels to have our best lineup in place and, um, you know, have the right mentality and just build our confidence within our athletes. I mean, we're going to wrestle good teams first semester. You know, I think we're going to have four – four or five top 25, top 20 schools. Uh, we see Ohio State, Northern Iowa um, here in December. You know, we're going to be – we'll be wrestling some good teams, but, um, you know, challenge our guys. We're trying to grow uh, and try to be greater later, and that's a mindset that we, we have within our program. We grow as we go, and we want to make sure that our guys are seeing the best competition but also knowing that they can compete against uh, the best of the MAC. And then, you know, when we get, get to the MAC duels, uh, that's important for seeding. So – uh, just making sure that we have a good game plan against our Mac opponents and ultimately um, peaking at the right times. You know, it's important to win early and it's important to get the the key matchups and our and strength to schedule for uh, the national uh, to be a national qualifier. But it's also important that we're um, that we're able to to compete at a high level, you know, at the end of the season and uh, win those close matchups in the duels and, and get our guys the right in the right position to win at the Mac tournament. Um so we're fired up, you know, the last time we uh, we won our second EWL title back to back in 2019 at George Mason. So 2023 Max is at George Mason. So we see that as an opportunity to repeat and uh, do something really special within our program. And, you know, I think uh, our alumni and our fan base, uh, they're just so supportive. So we're we're hopeful that we can come back and, and just, um, you know, I wouldn't call it overachieving, but, um, you know, we always consider ourselves the underdogs, no matter if we're ranked first or 10th, you know, so we're trying to just um, give our guys the best experience. But, yeah, we're going to be ready to go. And uh, we have a good young team this year. We have some leaders and, and Anthony Noto and Ashton Eiler and uh, guys that are returning Mac finalists. But we also have some guys that are under the radar that are, you know, they'll be developing. We'll see them, we'll see them battling uh, to score points for us uh, when that time comes. Eiler's an Ohio guy. Yep, right. Iowa. Then, uh, Eiler's Ohio from and- – Eiler's from Claymont, right? Claymont, yep. He wrestled Rocky Jordan in the state finals and rode him out the whole third period and almost turned him. Hmm. Did you know well, that? I did not. No, I don't, I I followed some of his uh, – he was at place the Super 32. You know, he's just one of those – I mean, he's a junkyard dog. He's He was at Iowa Central for a couple of years. Um He's very dedicated. Uh, he's a junkyard dog. I mean, he is grinding it out every single day. And for the team this year, he went from 165. He dropped to 157. Wow, he's going to be massive. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's a big boy. So he's had a close loss this past weekend to Ed Scott, who's ranked sixth in the country. I think he really had him on the ropes and just took a bad shot. But he's – yeah, he'll be a guy that's – you know, he, he cut the weight to, to make sure that we had the best team – that we could put in place to, to make way for, um, for Avery Bassett, who's a 165 pounder that transferred in from George Mason, who's a more of a natural 165 pounder. So, you know, he's a team player, but he's a, a constant in the room and uh, drives a, 
a hard bargain. You know, he's, he's a guy that's going to hold people accountable. So that internal leadership is big and, you know, having guys like that in the room, I think are going to bring us, uh, continue to bring us forward. And, um, but yeah, culture, the freshmen are doing a great job. Um, you know, we have just a good group returning and we just got to stay healthy and continue to push our guys. And it's going to be a, going to be an incredible season. It's just like so tough, such a long season and just such a grind. And I just don't know if people understand how tough this division. One thing is, I mean, it's tough. Hmm. And then obviously being a smaller school, um, Last year, the SoCon had one All-American. The MAC had zero, even though you had a bunch of quality. You had a five-time MAC champ and um, Matt Stencil. You had all these really good guys. You guys were not able to, you know, ultimately have an All-American for the conference. You were low on bids last year, in my opinion, comparatively in years past. Obviously, Minzu leaving had something to do with that. They would draw 10 bids usually, nine or 10 bids. So obviously you guys were behind the eight ball with having eight or 10 last bids. Um, you know, what does the Mac got to do as a whole to perform at that level to where we're having three, five, eight, you know, I mean, look, look what Arizona state did. Look what uh, you know, Oregon state, look what the pack did last year with Stanford. Look what they did with six teams, right? Look, you know, and one of them being little rock, who's a, the affiliate member, much like you guys are an affiliate member. What's the Mac got to do to get back where the Mac was as far as all American count at the NCAA tournament and round, round of 12 versus ultimately what we want to see. We want to see round mm -hmm. of 12 because that means you're there. You're right there. Round of 12 versus it used to go like a lot of it used to go on your round of 12. We didn't, I don't, did we have a round of 12 or last year in the mid American conference? There weren't many, you know, we had a few guys that won matches, you know, I know central Michigan. I know, um, you know, certainly I think Clarion, I mean, I think there were a few, but, um, the round of 12 last year was tough, as you know. I mean, you look at some of those first-round Russell backs, and you had two former All-Americans going at it, you know. Um, there's It was just a tough year, you know. But ultimately, we got to wrestle better teams. We got to expose our athletes to to uh, to some, some more of these top 20 teams so we can build the confidence, get the reps. And, uh, you know, it, obviously it starts with the recruiting battles. We got to win, win some battles in the recruiting field. We got to bring in guys that are, that have that potential. Uh, but then once we get them in, we got to, you know, we got to expose them to the best wrestling, whether that's, um, you know, freestyle tournaments, uh, big dual meets, um, you know, so it, it's a many levels, it's a battle at many levels and it's always going to be a challenge. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been done before. Um, it's, it's obviously, uh, Missouri left and um, I think made the, the Mac just sort of a more balanced conference, but they took a lot of all Americans with them too. So the coaches are working hard, you know, I'm impressed with, you know, some of the teams already. And, um, you know, you saw Ryder beat Purdue last week or this past weekend. Um, and you see, you know, guys winning matches against nationally ranked guys. So, um, you know, the, the work is, the work is ahead of us. I think the coaches are working hard, uh, but we got to manage a lot more than, than, and uh, you know some of these big schools, so we're uh, we're up against the wall, and this is to be a good year to to test ourselves. And you know, I think we have in our program alone three or four guys that can be in the round of twelve or a place. You know, so I think every program is going to do their best to uh, get their guys ready. And you know, ultimately, it's uh, the the national tournament is the the biggest stage in wrestling. Um, so having experience there helps, uh, but just having guys that can believe and that are fearless and aren't afraid to leave it all on the mat. Um, so we're Tulsa is going to be a fun ride and, and, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of months ahead of that before we get there. But, uh, like you said, wrestling season's a grind and you gotta, ha you gotta keep your guys active and you gotta have active recovery days and you gotta keep them fresh too. It's about getting better, but it's also about them having, you know, the passion to step on the mat and to compete. So that's, that's sort of our goal at Lock Haven is we want to wrestle good competition We'll take some breaks, but at the end of the year, we want to be hungry and ready to, to take on the biggest challenge, which is one of the MAC championships and, and uh, you know, having guys competing to be all Americans. Ayler wrestled Rocky Jordan at 170 pounds in the state finals. And it was a five, three <laughs> match. I just looked it up as I was talking to you. Cause I know he rode him out and almost turned him a couple of times and the crowd was calling for stalling. And I'm a huge Rocky Jordan fan. You know, he's at Chattanooga at 74, but Ashton's now at, 157 and he wrestled 170 as a senior he's a scrappy junkyard dog he's an ohio guy i'm cheering for him 
Noto, obviously a huge fan. He's a New York guy right on the PA line. I like him. I like everything you're doing, but I real quick before we, uh, I know we're, we're getting towards uh, the end of our time here, but um, you and Josh Moore are twins. You're 10 minutes older, right? You guys had two of the craziest, most, most historic seasons in the history of the NCAA as far as pins go. I remember one year that I remember you had 30 plus pins. Am I, am I saying that correct? That it was a 34? 34. Yep. Is that the NCAA record still? I don't know. I think um, 1970s. Was it like uh, Chal- hey. Chalice had for like a bunch, right? Yeah, Chalice had a bunch, um, but sort of a modern day record. You know, well, I was going to say that's the modern day record. Because they used to wrestle in like the, the the national division and the collegiate division, right? Like that's I believe what Clarion used to do, and then they wouldn't get scored in the team. And that was one year they had two champs, and they weren't in the top ten because I don't think they scored them because they wrestled in another division the week before. It's it's just wild to think that you pin thirty four guys in a D one season, and you did that at UVA, correct? Yep, yep, UVA, and I think that same year. Josh had 24 pins at Penn State, um, you know, so we were kind of battling back and forth. Um, my schedule was a little bit easier than his, uh, but I had been in the Big Ten, obviously, the year before and had uh, something like 20 pins. But, uh, yeah, it was just a style. I think it was a mentality. Uh, and wrestling in the Big Ten for four years and then going to the ACC, the ACC wasn't quite as competitive back then, so it just – things slowed down from a technical standpoint, uh, a lot more clarity in wrestling and, um, you know, d- just a little bit different, different feel. So uh, really, really cool experience and um, being able to wrestle at a different school, but, you know, obviously learned a lot of stuff at Penn state and, and developed our style there, but, you know, take that somewhere else. And just, I think it was part of it was, there wasn't as much pressure um, or what you didn't know as many people and just going out there, leaving it on the line. And, you know, the mentality was, you know, pin everybody. And I always tell people, you know, when we didn't, when I didn't pin somebody, I would, uh, it would bug me, you know, I'd stay awake for, for nights just thinking about, man, I should have had a pin, you know? So the goal was, the goal was to pin everybody. You know, I really think, uh, you know, you see guys that do that now and they're just successful because they put fear in their opponents. They, uh, they cause their opponents to have nervous energy would ultimately get them tired and they kind of take some out of their game plan. So, there's been a lot of great wrestlers and, you know, there's a lot, a lot of guys that still wrestle that same style today, but uh, being a twin helps, you know, having, having a built in workout partner and, and just having that right mentality and um, you know, headlocks and cradles. And, you know, you gotta, you gotta have pinning combinations. You see guys that go out there and grind out one point wins. Well, you know, that's great. Uh, but that wears on you eventually. So if you can pin, you know, 15 or 20 guys in a year, that's a lot less wrestling. So a lot less wear and tear on your body and your mind. And I think that plays its uh, plays its part when you get to the end of the year. You know, I was talking to uh, Dylan D'Amelio's dad, Dom D'Amelio. He runs the National Middle School Duels. And Dylan D'Amelio is just a grinder for Ohio State, 141 pounder, just a grinder. And I, and I, in my opinion, you know, you can call me delusional, whatever you want. I think that guy can grind out wins, right? I think that guy can beat people. But I don't – I think it's really hard when you don't have, like, Jay Jaggers had a cradle, right? Jay Jaggers could cradle anybody in the country. That makes things a lot easier on you when you don't have to hand fight a guy, push him around, battle, scramble, do all this crazy stuff. When you have the ability to – or there's even fear of it, the guy will turn down in, in certain situations because they don't want to get a cradle strapped on them. They don't want to get – mixed they don't want to get body cradle what's your brother leg cradle johnny thompson in the quarterfinals i want to say right like there's these crazy things that adds being a pinner like what you're saying i think that if a you know like a guy like dylan demilly in my opinion i think he can win but he's gonna have to do it with five grinding out war type victories and can your body hold up right like mm-hmm. like you're saying it takes a lot off your plate as far as your bodies your joints mentality we well, can just pin people. <laughs> the match is shorter. You're expending yeah. less, right? Well, you can, you know, obviously you, you expect to be better than at that level. You probably are if you're pinning that many guys. But, you know, you can beat guys on a bad day. You might pin somebody that, um, you know, that you normally wouldn't beat if you're having a bad day just because of that, 
that skill set. So, um, you know, you see that you see guys that you see a lot of guys that upset um, guys that are better than them, and a lot of time it's because they catch them or pin them. And uh, when you are when you know what you know the positions you need to be in, um, you know the other mentality is wrestle as much as possible and just uh, get as many reps on the wrestling mat. So. You know, that's something me and my brother used to do all the time. You know, my junior year at Penn State, I wrestled 63 matches, uh, which was, which was I think, an NCAA record and and um, 50 some wins in a year, which was a record at Penn State. So, not because we were being forced to. I think we just like to compete. So, uh, enjoying enjoying that opportunity to compete and then having some big moves. You know, cradles and headlocks and you know being good with legs and and scrambling. You know, those are all things that I think it's a deadly combination if you put all those things together. Um, it's exciting to watch, but it was also just knowing that you could pin somebody and not have to wrestle for seven minutes gives you a little bit more enthusiasm when you step on the mat. Does it help that the refs know what they're looking at? For example, Josh bought a leg cradled Johnny Thompson, I think two times. Then I don't think they knew what they were looking at one time. I think that, that like your coaches are like, he's got it on his back. He's in control. What are you doing? I want to, well, didn't that happen in that situation? They didn't even know what they were looking at. I don't think. Yeah, I think he only got – I think the one time he, he didn't get back points, he had him on his back for 10 seconds. Or yes, something. but they didn't know what they were looking at. That's the part I'm talking about. The guys – the refs literally didn't know what they were looking at. Yeah, well, now you have the danger rule. So yeah, the, the danger would, 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 would yeah. cut through all that. Now they would, just yeah. be, it would, they would know it's a danger, danger one, danger two, and they would be telling, hey, Red, Johnny Thompson, hey, Red, danger one, danger two, and then it would have gone right into the count, right? And then it would have been a six-point move. So he would have beat him by even more, right? Think about it. It would have been a six-point move instead of a two-point move. Isn't that wild to think about that? I mean, they didn't know what they were looking at. Um, Josh had the movie made about him, that film, that, like, independent <laughs> film where it shows him doing all the crazy head butts and <laughs> yeah. ramming guys into tables. Talk about your guys' matches in the rooms. Talk about at home. Like, tonight, right before this, before I put my kids to bed, they wanted to wrestle. So we wrestled for 15 or 20 minutes on the floor. Have them thrown halves on me. The dudes fight a lot. It turns into a fight most of the time. What was it like between you and Josh? You were together at Penn State for three years, right? Yeah, we were. And, you know, we, we grew up wrestling each other all the time and competing against each other. And, um, you know, at Penn State, it was in college, we got to the point where we just worked together. You know, we would still beat on each other, but. Uh, it was more like we were a team. So if anybody would say anything to one of us, then both they were fighting both of us, you know? So that was, what's cool was we got to the point where we realized that, you know, it didn't really do any good to beat up each other. Now we, um, we did wrestle each other a lot. I think the cool, what something that was real cool is that he went to Edinburgh his first year. I was at Penn state. So we didn't train together, um, but we both developed some similar skill sets you know, so we'd see each other on break and, you know, we'd work on stuff and be like, I mean, that's the same thing I was learning. So I guess probably because, uh, you know, Timmy Flynn was a Penn State guy um, and he actually wrestled right or right around the same era as uh, Troy Sunderland. He was our coach. So I'm sure that had something to do with it. But um, but yeah, a lot of battles um, and just the physicality of, you know, just what we were able to do. And I think um you know, having somebody that was a build-in partner, having somebody that, you know, that would hold you accountable uh, outside of the room uh, was huge. And you see a lot of brothers that are successful, but yeah, we got, we, we got into a lot of fights even in college and uh, you know, but mo at the end of the day, we knew that we we're there to support each other and uh, really cool moments, you know, wrestling, uh, warming each other up at the national tournament um, and just seeing each other's success. Uh, but we we're also, it was kind of like a silent, you know, support where, um, you know, you just knew that the other one was there to support you, but you know, it wasn't like, Hey man, go kick some butt. You just, you knew that they were there ready for you and wrestling back to back and dual meets, you know, so there's, there's a lot to be said for it. And I think it made both of us better wrestlers and, you know, still to this day makes us both better coaches. We, we talk a lot about what's going on in the sport and what we can do, how we can both build our program. So good brotherhood and good competition goes a long way in this sport. When he was an All American, he was third at thirty three. You were at forty one. What place did you take at forty one? Uh, fourth, my junior year. So four, he was third. You were fourth. He beat Roberson for third and fourth. The guy who beat him in the NCAA finals. 
He said he beat the guy like 14 to 1 or something crazy. Yeah, I think it was 13 to 3. Something crazy. I mean, it was major decision, right, is what he told me. And I was just like, that's amazing to me how crazy that can be in a year. The guy beats him with like the crazy shuck buyer or whatever he hit him with and beats him in the NCAA tournament. And then you were fourth and third, right? Because you uh, wrestled uh, Cliff Moore in the semifinals, right? Yeah, I was undefeated going in, number one seed. And, um, you know, that same that same success of wrestling back-to-back kind of got the best of me. I was watching my brother wrestle in the semifinals. Um, at the time, it didn't seem like that big of a deal. You know, but now being at multiple national tournaments, I should have been focusing on myself and come up with a game plan and just kind of being more focused in the moment. But at that point in time, I was taking it all in and just watching his match and, you know, I remember him getting done and winning and just, you know, just kind of being in a different light and then right away stepping on the mat and uh, just wasn't focused, wasn't in the moment and um, just didn't, you know, wasn't able to get the job done. And uh, but, you know, after that loss came back and pinned um, two guys to take third and won the Gororian Award at the national tournament. And then, uh, um, yeah, so just recovered well, you know, and being able to finish the tournament strong. Um, but yeah, some of those moments where you're, you're, you, you're cheering just as much for your brother as you, uh, you are yourself and you get lost in, in where you're at, you know, so that was a little bit of a problem, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't have it any other way. I think we both reached some high levels and, you know, just having each other enabled both of us to be more successful. How many pins did you have at the NCAA tournament that year, the year you took third and you had 34 pins? I had three pins and they were all in the first period. Oh my God. But um, who did you, what, who are the guys? Tell me the three victims. Do you remember? <laughs> uh, one of them was Gallic, who was, who ended up being a national champion. The Iowa Nate State guy? Gallick. Nate Gallic? Yeah. Yep. One was Gallic. Nate Gallic in the first period. Yep. One was Gallic. Oh. One was Jason Mester. And then, um, oh, can't Jason think of the Mester. other kid's name. Jason Mester's Jason. tougher than Hal, dude. That guy's real yeah. tough. <laughs> Yeah, the he guy's was like tough. real tough. He's a two-time yeah. All-American for Central. Yeah. Oh and then my I, God, dude! I was the funny thing is uh, I was wrestling a kid from Cal Poly the second match. So I got some guy I still remember his name, Blake Gunther from Wyoming, first match, and I swear he had his knee taped up, so I couldn't cradle him. But I ended up beating him pretty good, majored him, and then second match I was wrestling a kid from Cal Poly, but my brother was wrestling right the match next to me. And I knew I was going to pe- beat the kid, so I wasn't really worried about it. So I was trying to watch my brother's match as I was wrestling oh this guy. Are and you serious? Tell your guys never to do anything what you're saying right now. Uh, so he double-legged me, and the coach got all fired up, you know. And he double-legged me, and so I turned back in, got back up to my feet. Uh, and I was still – I think my brother was wrestling Gutnick from Wisconsin maybe or uh, – forget who it was. But, yeah, it was a, a tough kid that he had lost to at Big Ten. So second round at Nationals. And uh, the kid had shot again, and I kind of got annoyed, so I did this little leg hook thing that I do, pressure back into him, headlocked him, and just pinned him, and then went over and watched my brother's match. But um, <laughs> so I think my confidence was a little bit too high, uh, and uh, it got the best of me when, when you know in the semifinals. But yeah, it was a it was a good bracket. Um, I think I had Coit Cooper and uh, in the next match, and then um, yeah, that was a year that you know obviously. Um, and Coop, think Coy Cooper was an All American at your weight. Coy Cooper was, yeah, and Tion yeah. Ware was in there. And uh, oh my God, who'd you beat? Tion had board? lost. Um, I think he took six that year. He was a returning national champion. But... Who who did you beat in the third fourth match? That was Mester. Mester, okay. Yeah. Hey, so, over your over your left shoulder, I see a Penn State singlet. Is there a UVA singlet over there too? Yeah, I got a Penn State lock Haven and, and UVA. Okay, that sounds looks like you got all the bases covered. I like that. Yeah. And then, I can't see anything on this video, so I, I don't know what you're looking at. I'm looking, yeah, just lean <laughs> right a little bit. Just lean right a little bit. Yep, I got lock. I got the red one is or the orange one's UVA, middle one is Lock Haven, and it looks like third place is Penn State. Got it. Um, so yeah. coach, you talk about um you and Josh were not Pennsylvania state champs, correct? Correct. So it's like you guys had this really unconventional path, but I think it speaks a lot to Pennsylvania, right? Because it's such a tough 
state where you got was one of you runner up and one of you was fourth or so what was your placements i think my brother took second third and fifth um and i had taken fourth and sixth that were those are your guys's placements of the state tournament in pennsylvania you you go on to break the modern day pin record two-time all-american third and fourth josh is third and second and you guys were like this crazy epic home run battle of pins you know, I think, you know, you were in the ACC, he was in the Big Ten, and you guys were second, he was, was he second, third, and fifth, is that what you said? Yep, yep. And, and you were fourth and sixth. So what do you say to kids, when, what are you looking for when you're looking for kids? Are you looking for two, uh, Josh and Scott Moore? Because you can do that in Pennsylvania, right? Like, you don't always have to go get the big division champ. You guys can go and get, and you can see these qualities in people, you know what you're looking for. Is it all right to go and get? Because I know Michael De Palma. You know he was an All American for Kent State. He was one of my tenants. He took like eighth place in Pennsylvania, right? Like sixth and eighth place. You can get. You can be a PA state placer. I know John Stutzman lived off that at Bloomsburg when he was at Bloomsburg. You know, Matt Moley was never a state champ. I think he was fifth or something. He was going and getting the fifth placers, the sixth placers from Pennsylvania, and they were going to the NCAA tournament, getting in the run as well as being All Americans for him. Is that how you guys are you looking for similar to like guys like your brother and what John Stutzman was looking for when he was at Bloomsburg? I mean, you're you're looking for guys that you know that are placing high at the state tournament, but you're also looking for guys that just haven't peaked yet. Um, it's a tough state. I mean, you have there's freshmen that you know we just watched this past weekend that you know took fourth or fifth in a state that are beating you know top twenty guys as true freshmen. Uh, there's so many good examples of that. And we've had a few within our program, you know, Ronnie Perry was seventh in the state. Um, you know, Kyle Shoup was never a state champion. He became an all American. It is getting harder. I mean, these kids are so exposed at the club level um, at these big tournaments. So there's not really a lot of secret uh, recruits out there anymore. And you have such a lot more exposure. So you have, you know, programs coming in from all over the country. Um, you know, Nebraska is known for coming into Pennsylvania. Um, obviously, you got North Carolina, Virginia Tech. Um, you just have so many great programs in the state alone. Uh, but, yeah, just finding that unique blend of kids that still have something left to give and kids that are just motivated and that want to buy into that mentality. And You know, we've we've been able to find quite a few, and, and that, that's our goal, um, you know, as a program. But, yeah, it's – Pennsylvania kids, I think they're just they're just tested differently. They wrestle on the mat. Um, you can see somebody who I think the key is finding somebody who is very confident in what they're good at. So Kyle Shoup was really good on top, and you know he developed a skill set um, to get better on his feet. But he was one of the best top wrestlers in the country, hands down. Could tilt anybody, um, and if he tilted you once, he was probably going to tilt you twice. So. Um, you know, he's at Buffalo now, so he was a great example of that. But, you know, even getting guys that were, um, you know, not even state qualifiers that are making it to the national tournament. And those guys are – that's a lot of progress as well. So we're – yeah, we're out. We, you know, we got some good recruits signed right now. We continue to recruit the best guys that fit our program. And I think that's key. It's not about the guys that place the highest. It's the ones that believe in your coaching style and your program. They're going to stick around you know, through tough times and through setbacks, they're going to stick around and, and, um, you know, stay with us for four or five years. And those are the guys that we're going to continue to, to be able to develop and, and get to the national tournament and uh, create memories and a lot of stories. And, but yeah, it's a, it's a Pennsylvania is a tough, uh, tough state. And you, you see that all the time. And um, I think that's why you have, uh, it's probably the most highly recruited state in the country um, and some of the best clubs too, with, you know, Young Guns Wrestling Club and obviously Quest, 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 Young Guns, Dark Knight. I mean, there are the amount of clubs in Pennsylvania. It makes my head spin, man. I only think about this. Think about the curious case of James Snapper Fleming. <laughs> you remember that? You remember <laughs> that guy? <laughs> yeah. He had the crazy like side back headlock, and it was like everyone I ever talked to said it felt like their teeth worked. He wasn't choking. He wasn't doing this. They said it felt like their teeth were going to explode in their in their mouth. Like, how do you even find that pressure? How do you make that out? Here's a statement Tig Moore made to me, uh, and I, I've had a couple of people. 
you actually brought it up earlier. A lot of the PSAC schools, like what you guys are, they're teacher colleges. And what you had was a lot of these guys would go and they would become teachers. So they would go back and they would teach the college wrestling style, like the riding time, brutalize people on top, don't let them off the mat, no free escapes. That was what, you know, Teague said it. I want to say Coleman Scott said it to me before. A, a, a couple other PA greats have been like, no, it's because Pennsylvania has all these teacher colleges and mm-hmm. these guys wrestle and then they go back and they, they coach in the middle school and the high school level. A lot of them do. And that's the style they teach. And I'm like, that's a great point. And it wasn't yeah. just Teague. I forget. It, it might have been Coleman. I don't know who it was. But do you feel like that's kind of why Pennsylvania has, has such a strong – culture of Matt wrestling and like a Ronnie Perry so dominant that James Snapper Fleming so dominant on top. Yeah, they all come from I mean, you look and you're probably right how many high school coaches wrestle in college in Pennsylvania compared to other states. So there's a ton. I mean every 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 where you turn, you know, it's Lehigh Valley or the Whippeal. Um, you know, now down in, in district three you have some good, you know, chance Marcel run his club out of Alvernia. Uh, yeah, it's just the best of the best. These kids are getting training at another level. They're, they're partners that they're wrestling with. Um, kids are traveling up to M2 training center, which is M2 mad assassins. I just saw all of these clubs this past weekend. It's incredible, man. It's the training they're getting. Obviously, uh, the young guns, Bishop McCourt, Ranger pride, uh, uh, the compound Johnstown, what they're doing. If you look at like the Jack's forest and the, the Bassett kids and, I know you can't mention those names, but I can. Is that still a stupid rule? Is that still a stupid NCAA rule? Can you can you still can you mention recruits' names yet or not? I don't think so. Don't say it then. I can say it. I said it, but you didn't. But you yeah. know what I'm talking about. Those these, guys, these kids that are wrestling in the college tournaments and placing already. Yes, you didn't say any names though. I did. But I mean, it's just wild to see it. It's wild to see that people were foregoing their senior year. Was it Shapiro? Is a senior in high school technically, and he goes and he wins the Clarion. Right. It's like, it's amazing. It's amazing to see. And it, I think a lot of it started with like, obviously Kerry Colat, cause he was a, a phenom and a freak and a prodigy. And then like your Logan Steber was able to do that as a sophomore. He was third in the U S open. Obviously Henry Cejudo would be the best example of it. But um, I think that those three names I just mentioned and Kyle Snyder, those are the guys who really, I mean, we got to give those guys more credit too. We got to give those guys more credit because now, you know, like if you look at Ohio State, they've got uh, Feldman, Bazakas, and Mendez, and they bring all these guys in. And I think uh, Bazakas lost against Virginia Tech, right? Well, a lot of people are like, why isn't he going to, why, why isn't Nick Bazakas going to go undefeated? It's really hard. It's really hard to do. Give Logan Steber a little more credit. Give Kyle Snyder a little more credit. Give Nolf, give Nickel, give these guys who did these, uh, David Taylor. It's really hard, man. It's really hard, and I don't think a lot of people are in touch with reality. You know, like the Jack Forrest kid, he's unbelievable. You know, um, obviously, uh, Bo Bassett's unbelievable. Uh, you look at um, Spencer Lee, they're unbelievable. We need to, I think we need to put more – I don't think people are in, are in touch with reality as to what those, how good those guys are with the Nolfs. And, you know, it's just – it's incredible for me to, to – and, and the Steber and – it's it's incredible to see it though. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's a it's a sport that keeps evolving, and you know, in order to stay on top, you got to keep working, and that's essentially what you got to promote within your program. And you know, even at the youth level, it's you got to get the best partners. You got to keep showing up. You got to battle through adversity, and uh, and you're still not guaranteed anything. You know, you still got to make weight, show up, and see who's standing across the line from you. It might be somebody who put a little bit more work in. So. Yeah, it's it's a humbling sport, you know, and I it's it's just continue to get more competitive and uh, but that's every sport, you know, having kids that do travel softball and different, you know, specialization, they're not yeah. doing anything else, they're just doing that sport. Yeah. It's whose parents can can drive you to the most places and provide the most resources and then you got the kids that don't have any of that, they're just playing tough. So, yeah. Yeah, it creates a it's a cool dynamic and Ultimately, you know, there's predictors of who's going to be successful, but there's also the kids that just come through the woodwork that you just surprise everybody. So that's uh, you see it every year at nationals. You see it, um, you know, just with with the kids that are at these small programs. So it make, makes the sport special. And 
you know, uh, anybody can wrestle. You know, we talked about that at mindset today at practice. Um, anybody can wrestle, you know, there's going to be naysayers or negative, you know, people, ah, you can't do it, but keep working. And, uh, you know, you never know what opportunity you're going to have down the road. And, you know, obviously at Lock Haven, it's a small school, but you can win at a high level. And um, if you're having a great day and someone's having a bad day, maybe you'll get that top 10 win that you always needed. Yeah, I mean, just look at the Ronnie Perry National Tournament 2018 Cleveland, Ohio. Look at uh, Shoup in, uh, in Pittsburgh, All-American. You know, I've filed it under the James Snapper Fleming, two-time All-American. If you've got hmm. stuff that's dynamic, it's going to work on good guys, great guys. You just got to believe in it. Like you're saying, it's a mentality. You can do it. You got to believe in it. You can do it where you're at. You, I'm just pointed out two of your guys who've done it within. And it wasn't like it was like uh, uh, Coach Rogers or Coach Colad. It wasn't guys who were 25 years ago when they weren't born, right? It's guys that they've seen and they know of and they're in the room with. It's kind of awesome to see. Coach Moore, do you have anything else for me? Any good stories where Josh broke his hand punching your head or you punched? Josh in the head and broke your hand or any, any good ones, any good fight stories with you two guys or any fun stuff that you want to finish up here on this barbarian plus hour. No, a lot of good battles. Uh, you know, we, we were fortunate to have a lot of good coaches, but um, you know, Sammy Henson, Sammy, the bull was our coach for about two years at Penn state. And I think every day was a survival mode. Um, he would put each me and my brother up against each other. Then he'd have both of us tag team and try to beat him up. And then, you know, if one of us was, was done and just tired, he'd just go sit in the corner and he'd wrestle the other one. And just a, a great, a great coach. Um, you know, but I think that intensity in the room is important to become successful. And, and I think both of us had great coaches at, at Penn state, Virginia, uh, great mentors, you know, mentioned coach Bernstein, uh, Danny Felix and, uh, Pat McNamara was a three-time All-American Michigan State, a guy that I learned a lot from. And uh, just crazy how awesome this sport is. And uh, But, you know, just get being around good people and uh, learning, being open-minded. Uh, so it's such a – it's a cool fraternity, uh, but it's intense, you know. And uh, being 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 held accountable in the wrestling room, having people that, that humble you on a daily basis – uh, is is why the sport is so special because you have to pick yourself up every single day and fight just to just to survive. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing at the Haven, and you know we're excited to get things rolling. And we've had some tough matches already, and we're excited to continue to grind throughout the season and see where we get come March. You guys did Russell Penn State. It was nine matches to one. Who did win for you guys? Anthony Noto got the uh, major decision. Oh, so it was well, – well, you got four. You got four then, right? Yep, yep. I mean, they're really good. I don't think people really – I don't – once again, I don't think people realize you take this late 70s, 80s Iowa, and you take the current Penn State team, you take some of the 60s uh, Oklahoma State teams, and I think that now we're in a conversation where – and then obviously the, the Minnesota team that won with no national finalists in uh, early 2000s. I mean, those teams are worthy of talking about right? Like th those are the teams. And I just don't think people understand really how good Penn state is all else being equal. Yeah. Are you still a Penn state fan? No, Absolutely. as long as they're not against the Haven, you're okay with them. They're brutal. I mean, it was fun though. I mean, we appreciate just to be able to go back and wrestle there in front of, you know, eight or 9,000 fans. And, um, you know, it's, it's pretty cool, but yeah, they are pretty good. Um, some of the young guys, Bill Bartlett, Shane Van Ness. I mean, those guys, those are tough. They're so good. Uh, you know, obviously we know they're returning national champions at, at four weight classes, five weight classes. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was fun. All five I, guys are back. <laughs> five guys are back. And then they have some other guys that were about three other guys who are probably number one recruits in the country that have been training with world team members for the last two years. So they're, they're pretty good too. But, yeah, it was fun. We'll, we'll do it again. Um, we hadn't been back for seven years, so I was uh, – it was just time, and uh, yeah, they took care of us. I had a police escort the whole time, looking oh, after nice. me. Yeah, so I mean, something you're not going to see that at all the places. So yeah, they took care of us, and uh, you know, obviously, look forward to they. I was coming into Bryce Jordan Center on the 27th of January, so I think Josh is talking about coming down, so we may, you know, reconnect. Uh, I think it's Alumni Day, so being 15 minutes up the road, um, 
you know, definitely respect what they're doing. Kind of a fan, but not, you know. Uh, as long as they're not I, wrestling you. As long as they're not wrestling us. So. Yes. But, I mean, knocked them off at the NCAA tournament last year at 25. Yeah. Yeah. They're, and they I've already had that. hope. That was funny. Everyone's like, oh, that's huge. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think that's going to matter. I think they're pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. And well, then, it'll it'll be fun to follow. I mean, you know, we're all wrestling fans. Yeah. You know, we're, it, it's fun to follow um, individuals and teams. Uh, I mean, I find myself watching Big Ten Plus. Um, I'm looking forward to watching Maryland and Pitt Friday night. Um, hey, Pitt, but, Pitt's good, dude. Pitt's yeah. good. The, those uh, Howler brothers are really fun to watch. Yeah, from Hofstra. Watch those guys out. They're fun, man. The Howlers are fun. Obviously, Bonacorsi's the real deal. <laughs> Mickey Phillippe, you know, that'll be – he's good to watch. Obviously, uh, I think against Cleveland State, your brother coached up. Your brother coached this guy up against Matthews. Oh, my God. This dude had Matthews frustrated, and I think he tweaked Matthews' ankle off the mat. I mean, yeah, he, Matthews. He said it was a pretty good match. It was a good – no, I'm telling you, the guy battled. Because, you know, Matthews can pin anybody. He's got he's got the, 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 that extra gear, right? Yeah. He frustrated Matthews, but, wow, Josh's guy is just tough. Contested everything, and it was a scoreless first, man. It was a – it was a good match, and I think uh, Matthews might have tweaked his ankle. But I know Real Woods is actually out for the All Star meet. Did you know that? Yeah, I saw that. I today. thought Matthews was going to be out, but now Matthews gets to be like gets to rest, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully Cleveland State's not too tough. Uh, that's our first MAC duel of the year, January twentieth. So we'll be Where up, is in it? up in Cleveland. Sounds like I might have to be there. Yep. Well, awesome, it's... Coach. I appreciate you coming on the Barbarian Hour Plus. Coach Scott Moore, the the Lock Haven Bald Eagles, the MAC Coach of the Year, the reigning MAC Coach of the Year, and the defending champs. Got a target on their back. Can't wait to see you guys. Hopefully see you January 20th. Coach, thank you for the time. Stick around. Thank you, buddy.